Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha TV. I am Ashwarya Kapoor. 21 new faces were inducted into Prime Minister Narendra Modi's Council of Ministers on a day when the simmering tension between BJP and Shiv Sena came to a boil. We'll get you all the details on that and much more in the next half an hour in news tonight. But let us begin by taking a look at the headlines. Prime Minister Narendra Modi inducts 21 people in his Council of Ministers. Bulk of new faces from upcoming pole-bound states of UP, Bengal and Bihar. Former Shiv Sena leader Suresh Prabhu joins BJP before taking oath as cabinet minister. Sena responds by boycotting the swearing-in ceremony. Finance Minister Arun Jaitley promises rational tax policy and amendments in land acquisition laws to make India a global manufacturing hub. And Germany celebrates 25 years of the fall of the Berlin Wall. But global divisions prompts leaders like Gorbachev to warn India. In fact, the world is on the brink of new Cold War. The much-awaited expansion of the Union Cabinet took place today. Prime Minister Narendra Modi inducted 21 more faces in his Council of Ministers. Shiv Sena nominee Anil Desai's name was also in the list of new ministers, but he did not take oath as his party boycotted the swearing-in ceremony. Here are the details. 21 new ministers took oath of office and secrecy at a function in the Rashtrapati Bhavan on Sunday. It marked the first exercise undertaken by Prime Minister Narendra Modi to revamp his ministry after assuming power in May this year. While four leaders were inducted as cabinet ministers, three were made ministers of state with independent charge and 14 were sworn in as ministers of state. The list of new ministers included Manohar Parikar, Suresh Prabhu, J.P. Nadda and Chaudhary Birendra Singh as cabinet ministers. Bandaru Dattatre, Rajiv Pratap Rudi and Mahesh Sharma as Ministers of State with independent charge. The Ministers of State included Mukhtar Abbas Nakvi, Ram Kripal Yadav, Hare Bhai Parthi Bhai Chaudhary, Samarlal Jhar, Mohan Bhai Kundaria, Giriraj Singh, Hans Raj Ahir, Ram Shankar Katheria, Y.S. Chaudhary, Rajyavardhan Singh Rathod, Babul Supriyo, Jain Sena, Sadhvi Niranjan Jyoti and Vijay Sapla. The newly inducted ministers promised to work hard in their new role. जो चिमवारी हमारे तमाम सहयोगियों सहयोगियों को दी गई है या मुझे दी गई है हम उसको उसका देश के हित में सरकार के हित में और देशवासियों के लिए हम पूरा कार्य करेंगे. Sunday's cabinet expansion takes the strength of the Union Council of Ministers from 45 to 66. Of this, 27, including the Prime Minister, are of cabinet rank. 13 are ministers of state with independent charge and 26 are ministers of state. While portfolios are not yet allocated, sources say Manohar Parikar may be given defence portfolio that was held as additional charge by Finance Minister Arun Jaitley. Vishal Dahiya, Rajya Sabha TV, Delhi. Now, correspondent Kriti Mishra spoke to some of the newly sworn in ministers. Let's take a listen in. I'm joined by the newly sworn in minister, Mr. J.P. Nadda. Sir, many political analysts are saying that BJP kept in region and caste in mind while giving cabinet births. How would you refute that allegation? It's no, no need to refute the argument. Modi ji is representing India and he's representing every state. He's representing all sections of the society. So you met Prime Minister Narendra Modi over Chai Pi Charcha today in the morning. What were the issues that were discussed? Formal, it was a formal get-together where we met each other. We came to know who are the new ministers who are becoming. When is the portfolio allocation? It is the prerogative of Honorable Prime Minister. He'll do it as soon as possible. He does it. We'll be on the job. So maximum governance and minimum government. How would you ensure that being a minister now? You see, it depends upon the, it's the spirit. It's the spirit line. Uh, when you decentralize the job, uh, give, uh, take others into confidence, make them accountable, make your governance transparent, things go in this direction. So, welcome to Rajya Sabha Television and congratulations. Do you think defeating Misa Bharti, this ministership is a reward for it? No, 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 it is not fair, I think. Uh, Misa Bharti ji se hamara chunao tha, wo alag tha, wo niti o siddhant aur policy ke lai thi. There are other MPs hailing from Bihar who've been given the cabinet berth. Do you think the elections that are scheduled for next year, that is the reason behind it? No, actually, it's not that the elections are 
इस एक्सपेंशन का कोई मतलब है मगर ये बात सच्चाई है कि बिहार में चुनाव है मगर पूरे देश के पैमाने पर मंत्रियों को ओत दिलवाया गया है पहले भी और बाद में Bihar is politically a very crucial state but we can also not deny the fact that it is a backward state so now being a bjp representative what is your agenda for development ye ye bahut badi baat hai ki bihar ek pichhra pradesh hai aur hum log ki zimmedari banti hai jo koi mantri hain ki hum sab log mil kar ke bihar ka vikas kare i'm joined by the newly sworn in minister mr ram shankar kateria mr kateria First of all congratulations thank you you started with being an mp then of course you became in charge of all bound states then national secretary of bjp and today a minister how do you look at this journey and what do you think is the reason for this rise dekhi jo zimmedari mujhe mili hai mantri ke roop mein main manta hu ki ek badi zimmedari aur hamare party ke netritva ne hamare pradhan mantri ji ne hamare party ke rashtriya adhyaksh ji ne hame ye aashirwad diya hai You hail from Uttar Pradesh, uh, and BJP's Sino Shore has also become Uttar Pradesh during the elections. Now, how would you ensure communal harmony in this communally sensitive state? Look, from my side, there is no such thing as a Bharatiya Janata Party. This is a political thought. It 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 is a political The swearing in ceremony marked a sequence of events that further increased tensions between the Shiv Sena and the BJP today. Sena members absented themselves from the function to express the party's resentment over a cabinet rank being given to Suresh Prabhu. Here are the details. Main Suresh Prabhakar Prabhu Ishwar ki shapath leta hu. It was a rebuff for the Shiv Sena in Delhi whose effects are being felt all the way till Mumbai. Shraddha aur nishtha rakhunga. Main Bharat ki prabhuta और अखंडता अक्षुण रखूंगा द शिव सेना वॉज अनोयड बाय सुरेश प्रभु गेटिंग अ कैबिनेट रैंक इवन एज इट्स ऑफिशियल नॉमिनी आनंद देसाई वॉज बिंग रेलिगेटेड टू अ जूनियर मिनिस्टर इन एन अनप्रेसिडेंटेड रिपोकशन सेना चीफ उद्धव ठाकरे समन देसाई बैक टू मुंबई फ्रॉम द डेली एयरपोर्ट इट सेल्फ वाइल द पार्टी ऑफिशियली बॉयकॉटेड द स्वेरिंग इन matters came to a head on saturday itself when prime minister modi refused to hear out anand geete shiv sena's loan minister in his cabinet on its wishes on the cabinet expansion hum bhi maharashtra mein stable government sthir sarkar hamara pai jaye hum chahte hain lekin iska matlab ye nahi ki kuch bhi kare aur hum samarthan de maharashtra todne ki baat kare aur hum samarthan de mumbai todne ki baat kare hum samarthan de bhagwa atankwad kehne wale saath rahe aur hum samarthan de ye sambhav nahi hai Sunday's events in Delhi set the ball rolling for the upcoming government in Maharashtra where BJP's Devendra Fadnavis is slated to take a trust vote on Wednesday. Beech ka rasta isliye dekh raha hu jaise maine kaha ki ye jo desh vihar tak shakti hai wo apne nazar ke samne badhti dikhai de rahi hai aur uska agar muqabla karna ho to jitni sari hindutvadi taakat hai wo ikattha ho rahi chahiye lekin agar Uddhav ji lekin agar BJP rashtrawadi ke sath jana chahti hai to hamara rasta alag hoga. With the Sena all set to sit in opposition, it will be the BJP's first government in the state. Sharad Pawar's NCP is expected to abstain during the vote that will allow Fadnavis to remain chief minister. I think uh, the attempt has been made to really give proportionate represent representation to the allies also uh, because uh, many of the BJP members are being inducted today. TDP also one member has been inducted. Shiv Sena also was offered uh, 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 one or two uh birds in the in the union council so the party really wants to make it a very very kind of a fair representation of all parties in the in the national democratic alliance the sena had expected to join the government with important portfolios like home minister and finance demands that bjp felt were not justified for a junior partner ringing the curtains down finally on their 25 year old alliance with the sena bureau report rajya sabha tv And in other news finance minister Arun Jaitley today promised that his government will work towards ensuring a rational tax policy to make India a global manufacturing hub. He also insisted that the government will amend the tough land acquisition laws even in order to restore confidence in the economy. On a day when the prime minister expanded his cabinet, finance minister Arun Jaitley promised to make India a global manufacturing hub. He said the government will remove obstacles to land acquisition 
even if the opposition did not support it. He also underscored that the 2014 elections were a watershed in having brought governance to the forefront of the discourse. After a long time, we saw an election in India where the dominant issues were governance issues. There were issues relating to corruption, issues relating to probity, issues relating to the economy or the management of the economy or its mismanagement earlier. And third most important, there were issues relating to the quality of leadership. Jaitley also indicated that amendments the to the goods countries. and services tax may be introduced in the coming winter session of parliament. He said India had expanded trade with a number of countries and would like to bolster business ties with the SARC nations and as far as China is concerned, the economic relations continue to grow. There are a lot of mutual investments in both countries. There is a huge uh, trade between the two countries. But then we have a pending issue, the settlement of the boundary itself. And the commission appointed in 2003 for that purpose, uh, we do hope it functions more expeditiously. We continue to have uh, a dialogue with them and a meaningful dialogue. Jaitley also warned Pakistan that there cannot be a dialogue with Islamabad if ceasefire violations are repeated. His remarks came a day after Pakistani rangers violated ceasefire in the Uri sector in Kashmir, where a 22-year-old girl and a soldier were killed in the firing. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. And India on Sunday successfully test-fired its nuclear-capable Agni-2 ballistic missile. The test was conducted from the Vila island off the Odisha coast. The 17-ton missile is 20 meters long and can carry a payload of 1,000 kilos. It has a strike range of more than 2,000 kilometers. The Agni-2 intermediate-range ballistic missile has already been inducted into the services and today's test was carried out by the specially formed Strategic Forces Command of the Army as part of training exercise with logistic support provided by the DRDO. Let us now get you some other stories from across the nation in Nationwide. Jammu and Kashmir authorities tightened security in the state as it geared up for the assembly polls. Extra forces also arrived in the state to ensure safety and fair elections. The polls will be held in five phases beginning from 25th of November. They end on 20th of December. The counting of votes will be on 23rd of December. The four missing naval personnel of the torpedo recovery vessel that sank on Thursday remain untraceable. Thunderstorms and rainfall hampered the search operations on Sunday. Around nine ships and a few aircrafts and helicopters have been deployed ever since the vessel sank off the Vizag coast. Former Union Minister G.K. Vasan has asked the centre to file a permanent solution to the fisherman issue. Expressing concern over the death penalty to the Indian fishermen by the Lankan court, he asked the government not to delay the process of bringing them back. All right, we'll take a very short break here. Coming up ahead, US strikes uh, to hit Islamic State convoy. Unconfirmed reports say al Baghdadi could be dead. Details on the other side. Welcome back after the break. Now, the Maharashtra government's drive against dilapidated buildings has hit a roadblock. Residents of the Kocha Tiwari in Mumbai are demanding that the government formulate a policy to protect the heritage structures. Understand this, please, though, because their village within the maximum city is home to some of the oldest cottages in the country. Take a look. Its residents take pride in calling it the calmest, most pollution-free oasis from the hubbub of Mumbai. Every building in Khotachiwadi in South Mumbai's Girgam area has its own individual architecture, its own story to tell. Some of these treasures date back 150 years and more. Common to most of them is that broad, luxurious Portuguese design. Most cottages are named after their first family head and have been passed down generations.
ये जमाना पहला था ऐसा बॉम्बे में ऐसा जगह नहीं था ऐसा बंगलो ऐसा पब्लिक इतना इतना पीसफुल जगह है ना पब्लिक बाहर गाँव से आते देखने को But there are worries even amid this calm. With maintenance becoming expensive, bungalow owners have succumbed to pressures from the Brihan Mumbai Municipal Corporation for redevelopment of the land. Some of the buildings have already been raised for construction of more profitable high rises. The heritage village shows signs of fading away. Maintain के आने के funds भी available नहीं है महाराज का problems होता है. In August this year, the BMC issued a circular asking all redevelopment projects to apply for approval from the Mumbai Heritage Conservation Committee before giving it to redevelopment. But the policy does not include Khodachiwadi. Its residents want to include in the heritage list so that a government can take up the responsibility of maintenance. This very small folk tale village is urging the government to provide and maintain the heritage that it had been preserving over the last 150 years. Will the government and the local body listen to this, or will this village survive on its own? With camera person Siddharth Rajkumar Rao from Khotachi Wadi in Mumbai for Rajya Sabha TV. Now, medical education is getting a makeover in India. Moving away from a 58-year-old curriculum, the Medical Council of India is planning a total revamp that will overhaul the entire syllabus and the way medicine is taught in the country. Take a look at our special report. In the last 58 years, medical science may have advanced leaps and bounds, but no one can say the same about India's medical school curriculum. It is necessary also to reorient medical uh, students so that when they finish a five and a half years course, including internship, they are actually in a position to be able to practice medicine on their own. Today, they are not. The Medical Council of India is revising the outdated syllabus with an expert committee looking at incorporating the latest in medical technology. At the MBBS level, teaching aids are planned for subjects like anatomy, pathology, and biochemistry. While postgraduate level and beyond courses will have new specialities and super specialities. We have said these life support courses, cardiac life support course, trauma life support course, pediatric, all must be made mandatory for that. Similarly, communication skills. We have highlighted this point. Then, problem-based learning. The new courses will also account for the disease profile in India. Infectious diseases, cardiology, and neuroanesthesia are to get priority. While general physicians will have a new postgraduate course. I'm sure that uh, with the changing of the curriculum to more skill-based uh, things, more practical things, our basic doctors, that is MBBS doctors, would be equipped with basic life-saving skills, basic treatment skills. Uh, to go to the uh, rural areas, to go to the uh, austere circumstances, and to work there without getting, uh, you know, sort of having any uh, any problems. For the first time, the council is also planning to obtain a copyright for its curriculum. It will then be distributed to medical colleges that will then conduct a one year's teachers training for the 2016 session. Anshu Jai Singh, Rajya Sabha TV. Now to some international news, the elusive Islamic State Supreme Leader Abul Bakr al-Baghdadi may be critically injured in a U.S. airstrikes. Now, unconfirmed reports said that a 10-truck IS convoy was targeted in Mosul in which at least 50 militants were killed. But despite the airstrikes, Sunni militants continued to carry out deadly bombings targeting Iraqi security forces and civilians. Time magazine called him the world's most dangerous man. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the self-declared caliph or supreme leader of the Islamic State, commands vast territories in Iraq and Syria. Now there are unconfirmed reports that he might be dead. Fighter jets from the US-led coalition destroyed a moving Islamic State convoy near Mosul in northern Iraq. Iraqi officials said a number of top militants were killed. U.S. Central Command was, however, unable to confirm the reports that al-Baghdadi was among the 50 casualties. A Mosul morgue official said 50 bodies of IS militants were brought in after the airstrike. 
Baghdadi made a rare public appearance at a mosque in Mosul in July. With a 10 million bounty on his head, Al-Baghdadi's profile as the world's most dangerous man has been rising, as his network of fighters have shocked with beheadings and suicide bombings. The US military said the airstrikes demonstrates the pressure it continues to place on the IS terrorist network. 1,500 additional U.S. troops will also join the 1,600 military advisers that are already in Iraq to assist the country's army. Meanwhile, a wave of car bombs killed dozens of people across Iraq on Saturday. At least 33 people died in Baghdad, with the deadliest attack killing more than 10 in the Shia neighborhood of Sadr city. In another incident, eight people, including a top police officer, were killed when a suicide bomber targeted an Iraqi military convoy in the northern town of Baiji, north of Baghdad. Bureau report, Raja Sabha TV. And on to Europe and uh, Germany celebrated the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall today. The wall was one of the icons of the Cold War and a cold reminder of the divisions between the capitalist West Berlin and socialist East Berlin. However, unlike the balloons that were released to symbolize uh, the fall of the wall in 1989, all divisions between East and West clearly haven't vanished into thin air. Here is more. The Berlin Wall illuminated against the night sky to mark the seminal moment when the Cold War was brought to an end, 25 years after the wall was symbolically torn down in 1989. It was time for Berliners to relive the joy and excitement of the East Berliners who could finally visit the West. Morgen feiern wir den 25. Jahrestag des Mauerfalls. Dieser Tag führt uns vor Augen, dass sich der menschliche Drang nach Freiheit nicht auf Dauer unterdrücken lässt. Im Laufe des Schicksalsjahres 1989 überwanden immer mehr Ostdeutsche ihre Angst. For the rest of the world, it was an occasion to revisit the promise of a globe without divisions. But as the run-up to the festivities showed, the scars of history are hurting more than ever. Former Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev is even warning that humanity was on the brink of a new Cold War. И в этой острейшей ситуации не видно роли и конкретных действий главного международного органа Совета Безопасности, президент Польши и премьер, премьер да? Премьер-министр Раковский, Раковский премьер. И премьер-министр Раковский. Раковский а... подошел ко мне и говорит, Михаил Сергеевич, вы знаете немецкий язык? Gorbachev's comments came in the backdrop of the Ukrainian crisis that he said offered an excuse for the United States to victimize Russia. Backing Russian President Vladimir Putin's stance, he said Putin protects Russia's interests better than anyone else. Western sanctions over Moscow's actions in eastern Ukraine caused the ruble to tumble dramatically over the weekend. Over 4,000 people have died since April, when pro-Russian separatists seized control of the eastern regions of Donetsk and Luhansk. After World War II, the Cold War marked an intense standoff and decades of one-upmanship between the United States and erstwhile United Soviet Socialist Republic. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. And in other news, a heavy shelling was reported in Donetsk, the eastern city of Ukraine, in the early hours of Sunday. The fresh fighting was seen as the worst since the tenuous September ceasefire. The report said that the shelling lasted almost eight hours and came on a day after a monitoring group reported large numbers of unmarked military vehicles in the rebel-held areas. Ukraine says Russia supplied the arms, but this has been denied by Moscow. In September, Ukraine and Russia had agreed to a ceasefire that has seemed fragile after the West condemned the 2nd of November rebel elections as illegitimate. And here is a look at some of the other stories from across the world in Global Buzz. A suicide bomber attacked the police headquarters in the Afghan capital of Kabul on Sunday. At least one senior police officer was killed and six others were injured. The Taliban claimed responsibility for the attack on Twitter. There was also a report of a second blast. The government said no one was injured or killed in the incident. Two Americans freed by North Korea were reunited with their families. Kenneth Bay and Matthew Tad Miller spent months in North Korea. 
They were freed after a rare visit to North Korea by a top US official who brought a letter from President Barack Obama. The release comes less than a month after North Korea freed Jeffrey Fall, an Ohio man who spent five months in detention. The US and Iran started high-level talks in Oman on Sunday ahead of a looming deadline for a deal on Tehran's nuclear program. US Secretary of State John Kerry met his Iranian counterpart Mohammad Javad Zarif to iron out the differences before the 24th of November deadline. The meeting comes after reports that US President Barack Obama wrote to Iran's Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei to push for a deal. The Catalans, people from Spain's northeast, voted on Sunday in large numbers in what is being seen as the strongest show of support for breaking away from the rest of Spain. The central government in Madrid branded the referendum as illegal after the Spanish High Court earlier issued an injunction allowing a non-binding referendum. And on to cricket news. Uh, well, a confident team India scored their third straight win in the one-day international series against Sri Lanka. The Indian batsmen were never in any kind of pressure as they chased down a modest Lankan score of 242 in their allotted 50 overs. Shikhar Dhawan with 91 runs and Virat Kohli with 53 helped the team wrap up the match with nearly six overs and six wickets to spare. The Lankan batsmen lost their way after a disastrous batting power play, losing three wickets for just 16 runs at one point. Mahila Jayawardhane's 118 runs of 124 balls managed to take them past 200. Omesh Yadav and Akshar Patel together took seven wickets for India. Looking to see what they have got available leading up to the World Cup. And they're continuing to experiment in the next two games. Magnificent victory there. And now let's take a look at other sporting action in sports speed. India won the fourth and last match of the hockey series with Australia in Perth, beating the hosts 3-1. The India backed the series 3-1 and India continued their pressure on the home team till the final whistle. India is now slated to play Germany in the upcoming Hero Hockey Championship in December in Odisha. The highest-ranked Indian woman squash player Deepika Palikal will not represent India in the next month's World Team Championships in Canada. Palikal said that she will prepare for the Singles World Championships to be held the same month. The World No. 16 said that she was skipping the event as she does not know about the event. Germany's Nico Rosberg snatched his 10th pole position of the season after beating a teammate Lewis Hamilton in the Brazilian Grand Prix. The German sees the top spot from Hamilton with a lap of just 0.033 of a second quicker than the World Championship leader who will be chasing his 10th win of the season which will be starting in a short while from now at Interlagos. Well, that's all in this edition of News Tonight. Thanks for watching. Good night.